Welcome to The Air Up There, a podcast about the wide world of aerospace. I'm Kenya Williams. Today's episode celebrates women in aviation. I'm Deja Matuire. The names Bessie Coleman, Amelia Earhart, Willa Brown, and Betty Skelton are familiar if you've studied the history of women in aviation. But what about aviation leaders blazing their own trails today? Like the women before them, this episode is all about women making their own history while creating a path for more people to enjoy the thrills of aviation. That's right, Deja. First up, we meet a military pilot turned FA lead test pilot. She's currently responsible for the team that tests new equipment and emerging technologies to ensure safety for pilots, passengers, and people on the ground. Our Kristen Alsop spoke with Lori Faber to learn about her adrenaline-packed world. She's flown countless aircraft and helicopters, but found a special love for gliders. So Lori, how did you even get started with aviation? Well, my, I got started in aviation because I was fortunate enough to go to the United States Air Force Academy. My class graduated 1,500 students, and there were only 100 women in that class that graduated. So you went to the academy um, shortly after it was opened up to women to begin with, right? That is correct. So you're a woman in a male-dominated school, and now you're being sought after to go flying. What did that kind of what was that experience like? Well, it was uh, it was very different. I went to a high school where it was pretty uh, diverse, and women held a lot of leadership positions. And so, it just never uh, never thought about it before that um, to go to an institution where the ratio was so high. And for the first time, you know, it was presented to me that women can't go do things. So that was a, a unique experience in and of itself. Probably the biggest thing I've learned is try not to focus on the first this, or I'm the only female. What you really have to focus on is doing the best job you can do. If you just look at life about focusing on that and focusing on your passion, that's all that matters. The rest of that, whatever other people have, you can't change their opinions, but they, you can definitely change how you handle the job and everybody's impression will change with you. And so, for you, you met the qualifications and you got to start flying. What was that like and what were you flying? Oh, it was great. So the first aircraft I got to fly while I was at the academy was a glider. And I always tell folks that was probably the, the most enjoyable experience I actually had because you have no motor. Basically, I get towed up by another airplane, tows me up into the air. So I'm like imagining when you see, you know, a, tr- a tow truck pulling a car or even on, you know, if you go water skiing, you see it being pulled behind a boat. Imagine another airplane basically with a rope, <laughs> basically tied to, you know, basically tied to another airplane that has no motor and picks you up off the ground and you try to fly behind it. And at some point it lets you go and you basically sail your way down back to back to the runway but it was just it's very peaceful it was really very interesting and the control you know when you finally fly with something motorized after that you you feel the pressure and inertia of the forces of the engines itself and the motor but this is you're just dealing with basic physics it's it's just a wonderful experience. I flew other you know basic trainer fixed swings for the Air Force and eventually um, I went into helicopters after that, and at the time, because the combat laws were still prohibiting women to fly into combat zones, I flew a utility helicopter known as the Huey, and that was the kickoff of Desert Storm. And so I spent quite a bit of time flying uh, a lot of the main generals back and forth to the Pentagon. So I had a lot of unique uh, roles during the war that even though I wasn't in the war zone, Later on, I went into a test pilot program and did a lot of test support. And basically, while I was there, the combat laws got lifted from the Clinton administration. So I, once again, I got sought after and calls came, hey, you're interested in flying some combat helicopters? And I definitely would be interested. It was something I had looked forward to doing. And from there, I flew Pave Hawks. I began to do combat search and rescue. We traveled everywhere. And I had some very unique missions while I was over there. President Bush Sr. came out, and I actually got to fly him around while he was there. Um, and he was uh, an honest-to-God gentleman, but he 
went out of his way to actually meet me before I flew him because he was honest. He, he was himself being a World War II veteran. He said, I've never had a woman pilot and fly an aircraft for me in my life. So I, I said, I had to meet you face to face because I never thought I would see this day. <laughs> it, was, it was precious. And then afterwards, he you know, told me what a great job and if I wanted anything. And I said, yeah, I'd like a picture with you and my crew. <laughs> he said, well, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, it was definitely uh, an enjoyable experience. That's quite impressive, honestly. I mean, you think about your your career so far, and you go from a place where women can't even fly, supposedly, right, to flying the president of the United States and being in combat. How does that feel for you as a woman? Well, I, I, you know, I, I looked at it more like, what does it feel for me as a person? But uh, <laughs> I'm very proud. I'm very proud. I'm very fortunate. Um, but I think the the driving force about everything is if you have a passion for something, you really, you can't let negativity get in your way. You have to, but you also have to be patient and wait. And you have to remember that life's a lot about timing. And, uh, you know, and some things are gonna be good and some things are not gonna be so good. And you have to realize that's part of life. And you have to always be prepared. You can't stop studying. You can't stop practicing. It is, there's always so much more to learn. So it is something I, I keep pursuing and practicing and looking for the next adventure. <laughs> and with that, I think that's why I, I have such great fortune of uh, pursuing my dreams. What kind of advice do you give um, girls who may not even know that they want to get into aviation like yourself? You know, you didn't have a strong desire to get into aviation as a kid, but here you are. Sure. One of the things that people don't understand when it comes to flying is that you're learning while you're physically moving and everything's a decision maker. You just, it's not like a car. You can't pull over to the side of the road and say, okay, let's talk about what happened. No, you're in the air and the, you know, the zero airspeed. So you, you have to kind of realize that everything you do has a consequence and you can't go backwards. You have to constantly, what they call, be ahead of the airplane. And that phrase alone is kind of mystifying if you've never flown. So you have to almost think ahead as to what's the next thing that's going to come? What's the next thing that's going to come? And if you've played a lot of team sports, a good example is soccer. You know, you're running down with the ball down the field. Okay, where's my next pass going to be? Okay, where is my, my wing on, you know, who's on my left, who's on my right, and somebody's also attacking you at the same time. Where are my openings to move? So that type of a skill is well practiced in a, a fast-paced team sport. So we should be recruiting more athletes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you don't have to be a stud. You just have to understand the concept. The work you do is so important, and I just kind of want to reflect again and consider, you know, where you started and the fact that you weren't even allowed to go into combat at first or perhaps even fly um, to now that you are the lead test pilot of the FAA. How does that feel? You know, it's interesting. I don't I don't really reflect on it as much. I'm, I'm more concerned about everybody else and what we do than I am. And I think that's a big piece when I, you know, younger, I think I worried about where I was going to go or how I was going to be treated and how, and like I said, if you focus on the work, you focus on each other and how we're going to get there, I think you learn that the the other piece of it is just not that, just not that important as much as reaching your dreams. Focus on the job you're doing and the next job will come and as long, you know, and, and figure out what ex, what it takes to be excellence. And it's a lot of sacrifice. It's not easy. So you have to figure out what you like to do, what you want to do, and what you're good at. And the three things together will be really about reaching your dreams and your goals. I can definitely see the changes in our environment over the years. And um, I look around and I think diversity is just uh, a wonderful thing. And I think it adds so much to the mix of that collaboration, which makes the, the work environment so much fun in all facets of life. Thank you so much for joining me today and talking about your career and inspiring that next generation of women to consider a, uh, a future in aviation. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I, I hope uh, this motivates any 
I would say everybody out there who's listening, regardless of uh, being a woman or not, that if you're interested in aviation or flying, please pursue it. Wow. From not being allowed to fly in combat to flying a former president, Lori has shown that through persistence and hard work, your career can soar. This next mother-daughter pair also hold a special place for the peaceful experience of a glider. Allison Duquette interviews Marissa Colclacher and her 13-year-old daughter, Ariel. With the name spelled like the aerial view she gets while flying, she was destined for a life in aviation. The barefoot flying mom, as she's known on social media, has been an airplane since she was born, and she's kept that tradition alive with her four children. In addition to flying with their mom, they attend the Soaring Academy, a nonprofit glider flight school where they are surrounded by aviation lovers. The Academy's early glider training may be a great way to begin a flying career. We were looking at your social media, so I thought we'd start there because you had a really great quote. Um, I think it was on your Instagram account that I wanted to just share with our audience. Um, you say, the sky isn't the limit to your dreams, it's the beginning. So I thought that was a great jumping point off for us to talk about um, what got you into flying, um, what you fly, how you ended up uh, sharing your experiences with your daughter, Ariel. Um, so Marissa, why don't you tell us a little bit about how long you've been flying and kind of how you got started? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having um, my daughter and I here today. Um, I've been flying for almost 20 years and um, I grew up around aviation, was in an aviation family. Uh, so it wasn't abnormal to go to the airport on the weekends and take to the skies and, you know, a little single engine airplane. Um, so there's just a lot of great childhood memories with that. And so I think from an early time in my life, you know, I realized that, that dreams aren't limited. They're not confined to just your, your own thoughts and way of thinking. So kind of like on the, on the quote that it's the sky um, isn't the limit that's the beginning. A lot of times we think that there's like this ceiling to what our dreams can be. And the more you start exploring the sky, you realize how how much more of it there is, you know. And so I think that that kind of went hand in hand. Well, you've obviously been a really great influence on your daughter and exposing her to aviation. So was there someone in your life when you started out that was either a mentor or kind of shared their experience with you? Yeah, my my dad flew, and so um, there was a lot of VHS tapes. That was what was the cool thing back then <laughs> um, at home, and and that was in the '80s too. So it was just you know any cool movies, you know, like the Disney Flight of the Navigator, flying was you know really prominent. But you know, my dad always encouraged me to to fly. Do, do you remember the first time he took you up? Uh, I was an infant when he, when the first oh, time okay. I went flying. Yeah. But, um, I, I, there's not really a time where I don't remember flying. So it's, yeah, it always seemed like a second home. And Ariel, how, how about you? Do you remember kind of the first time you went up in an airplane and, and what that felt like to you? Yeah, it felt really amazing. It's a really captivating. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you fly because everybody I think always thinks of, oh, you must be flying around in a Cessna or a Piper Cub, but you fly something a little different, which is really a great entry into aviation and that's gliders. And what, what does that feel and sound like when you're up in a glider? It's really amazing. It, you get an adrenaline rush uh, when you're taking off. The way you sit there and you get ready for the flight and then you take off and you're soaring free. It's really captivating. It's quiet. So usually, so when you're getting towed, you know, behind a tow plane, you do have, you'll hear the wind and whatnot, but then as soon as you release, it gets really quiet. And it's really, it just, it's magical. It feels like you're on this yeah. magic carpet ride, kind of. It's very peaceful, very serene. Uh, I was always intrigued with glider flying. Would you recommend glider flying for someone who's just starting out or wanting to get into aviation? Absolutely. Some of, some of the best students I ever had as a flight instructor were glider pilots. And even the Miracle on the Hudson, Captain Sully, he was a glider pilot. I mean, it teaches you, you great energy management um, skills and you're always thinking and feeling and I think it helps sharpen your your piloting skills. Now let's talk a little bit about Ariel and Ariel share with us how old are you? 
I'm 13. And how long have you been flying with your mom? Around five years. Five years. That's really impressive. So what are your plans moving forward? Do you think you will keep flying or would you like to fly other aircraft eventually? I like flying. I don't think it would become a career eventually. It's a really fun activity and I'd rather be into some maintenance instead. She's really mechanical. So <laughs> I heard that about you. I heard that you are really good mechanically. You like to fix things? Yeah. Well, we have some jobs here at the FAA. We call them tech ops. They support the air traffic control system, and they are very smart people, and they keep our all the equipment going. So you might want to look into that in the future. Thanks. Now, what do your friends think about the fact that you fly? I think it's really cool. It's different from everybody else's activities, and they think that's cool, you know? It's something else. Something different. Yeah. And it is different, but I think what... It's probably different compared to your friends at school, but there's a huge aviation community out there that loves to share the experience with young people. Have any of your friends ever asked you about it? Yeah, it's this school is a, a really good place to start. It's very uh, friendly and supportive. You get to fly and learn and it's a really good place to start. The school she's at is a nonprofit, um, Southern California uh, Soaring Academy, and they fly a lot of middle and high schoolers. So there's not a shortage of kids her age there. So what seems kind of, what might be abnormal once she's there, it's like there's lots of kids her age and they're all at different levels of, you know, where they are, if they're gonna solo. Ariel stalls away is because of her birthday's in the summertime. She can't solo until she's 14. So it's just, it's a really neat way for her to get involved with the community too. That's great. Now, what's the best part about flying with your mom, Ariel? It's, it's always fun every single time uh, we get to travel. It's so free. I love it. It's very freeing. Yes. And obviously your mom loves flying with you. Yeah. Yeah. So Marissa, what's the best part about flying with your daughter? I, I think it's the, uh, how the seasons change, you know, kids grow up quickly. And uh, when I first started flying with them, they were still somewhat passengers, but I was teaching them little things that, you know, was it within their realm you know what they could understand and now they're in the you know the pilot seat learning so it's your role as a parent starts changing too the older they get too where you come along beside them so it's a really neat front row seat of of watching that being there to support them is there anything else you would like to share with our audience um maybe someone who has never even been up in an airplane I would recommend looking into some of the the soaring communities and stuff and taking an introduction flight. But yeah, there's lots of scholarships and opportunities available too. That's great advice. Well, thank you, Marissa and Ariel, for joining us today on the air up there. Um, it's been great talking to you, and I hope um, you do well, and good luck to you, Ariel, when you solo in the next few months. Thank you so much for having us here. It's been great. <laughs> It's so great to see Ariel finding a common passion for flying and even exploring the mechanics of aircraft. Finally, we've got a special conversation between our own Shanetta Griffin and Winsome Linford. An engineer and a pilot now lead the FAA's Office of Airports. They share their love of aviation and how they are paying it forward for the next generation of leaders. <laughs> So really happy to be here. Happy to be here with you, Winsome, so we can uh, have a little conversation today. So look forward to it. So, Shanetta, how did you get into aviation? How, how did you come into a airports? You know, that's really a funny story, Winsome, because I think about how I, I got involved. And really, it was by accident, actually. So when I was in uh, high school, I had a career counselor that came and he brought in a model of a building that was being built right close to my school, my high school, and uh, talked all about architectural, mechanical, electrical engineering, and then started to talk a little bit about the roadways and the bridges and the site drainage and how the water went into these catch basins. And so I really became more excited about that. But when I decided to go to college, I said, okay, I wanted to be an engineer, but I really 
want to be a structural engineer. So I wanted to be the one designing the roads and the bridges. So the first company that I, I took a job with after college, really, I was doing those bridge calculations and it was so monotonous. The same calculations, same calculations. But this company also did small airports. They did some regional airports where they started, where they were working on taxiways and runways and all that site development. And so I just asked, hey, is that something I can learn more about? And so my supervisor gave me an opportunity to do that. And I fell in love, really. I mean, it was just because airports, and they say all the time, airports are like many cities. Well, it's funny you said that because I actually, I started out wanting from day one, to be in the aviation industry. I mean, um, from high school. And I wanted to be an airline pilot. And that's all I wanted to do is fly airplanes. And so I got to college, got into the professional pilot technology program. Somebody said, hey, why don't you get an admin degree? Because you never know when you're going to lose your medical. So I said, okay. So I added an aviation administration degree, a business minor and all that. Never had a thought that I'd ever use it because I want to fly airplanes. When I graduated, the industry was really not hiring. Unlike today, I would, I would love to be here today. They, we need pilots so bad today. But back then, not so much. And so I ended up working a job where the State Department of Transportation flying aircraft and doing airport inspections. And so after I did that for a while, I actually got to help write regulations for airport safety for the state and help change Indiana administrative code. And I thought, man, that's pretty cool. I have influence over the safety and operations of airports all over the state. So I ended up getting my master's degree in public administration and then got on board with the FAA as an airport inspector. And then I was hooked and I found my love. Really, it was aviation safety policy and providing oversight and ensuring that we in make sure all passengers maintain safety to their destination. It sounds like both of us were open to those those changes in our paths that led us to our passion and really the careers that make us happy today. Well, and you know, Winston, that's that's uh, exactly right. So as we, as women in these positions, and certainly the fact that uh, when you think about aviation, uh, it's come a long way in regards to opportunities for women. And we want to get more women interested in the aviation field. How do you work to try and get more women just involved in the STEM industry and STEM students and all these things? It's always being aware that you're a role model and looking for those opportunities. So um, a few weeks ago, I was actually flying on an airplane and I saw a young lady and she was wearing this sweatshirt and it said Federal Aviation Administration Drone Pilot. And um, she looked to be about high school, um, college age. And I, I walked up to her. I said, hey, I love your sweatshirt. Where did you get it? And she said, off of Amazon. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know they sold those. But I said, are you interested in aviation? And she said, yeah, actually, I have my drone uh, pilot operating license and stuff. So I said, oh, that's pretty amazing. I said, you know, talked about what she was going to school for in IT. And I shared with her the FAA's um, internship programs and talked a little bit about opportunities working for the FAA. And so there was an opportunity that, you know, it, it wasn't a formal setting. It wasn't a classroom. It was just two people flying through the system and happened to come across each other and and shared that information. And, and you've probably heard me say it about what I think my purpose is. And I believe that that's a part of my purpose is giving back and being the first African-American female to graduate from the University of Toledo and the College of Engineering. And then even in this position, being the first African-American female. But but one of the things that I always go back to with that, and I love this quote about being the first, but making sure you're not the last, um, is really what kind of drives me when it comes to not just women in in this area, but just students across the board. And I get so energized when I'm sitting and talking to students and, and just you see their eyes kind of just light up when you hear about engineering and you hear about the airplanes and you hear about the different things. But one thing that I think is important for all of them to realize is that even like you said, you wanted to be a pilot. There's so much more around aviation than just being the pilot. They can go and work at an airport or in the industry anywhere, and you can still do finance and IT and, and, and HR and all the things that they go to school for, but they don't really recognize it because, again, that point about education and just talking about it is so important. Do you remember when we talked to some of those, those uh, students? in the internship that they were here and they're excited about what they do and what their opportunities and now we've hired a couple of them so you know that's I think that that's a part of what we have to do in in our positions because we won't be here forever and there
they're our future. We've got to find ways of which to engage and make sure that we're bringing other women that come behind us. You know, this is historical for you and I to be kind of in this space as as two women leading um, this this um, this organization. But how do you feel about the positions that we're in? And the fact that we need to pave the way for the future generation of women in aviation. So, you know, this is always a a hard question for me because I really want to make sure that we're paving the way for everybody who wants to be in aviation. There's there's so many opportunities in aviation today Um, and and our our industry has become so broad with new entrants, um, UAS, advanced air mobility, uh, commercial space. And then just even all the opportunities that we have with our transportation system and our airlines and airports today. And so you really want to make sure that we're paving the way for for everybody to access. But as the aspect of for women is one, is doing my job to my best of ability, setting that example, showing that women can do this job and they can do it very well. And so I think that is that is number one, is you know creating that expectation that women can do this and they're good at it right? And that's the first piece. The second piece is that communication piece. I think a lot of it is that young women today don't know about these opportunities. And so it's it's going to those schools, especially in communities where they're not exposed to this. You know, they've never had an opportunity to go visit an airport. They don't get to travel in the system. So I think, you know, in those two aspects of one, educating about, you know, what's available and two is setting that example that women can do this job and they can do it well. I mean, you, man, you're breaking barriers all over the place. So, I mean, what do you, what do you see as that pathway? Well, you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head is just setting the example. You know, I have, uh, I have six brothers. So my example was, you know, we're going out and playing football and, and basketball and, and everything else. But Um, I think that what they instilled in me and taught me, even as a female with all of them as brothers, it was the example. You know, if I'm going to be around other young girls, what what am I going to share with them? You know, and I think about my daughter and the example that I want to set there. This isn't something that is so far stretching. You know, there's so many opportunities. There's so many things that we can do. But how are we going to, one, bring people to the table? And then how are we going to make sure that there's anything that's that we're going to do and anything that they want to do that they have the capability to do? Like you say, you can do this job and you can do it well, or you can do any job and do it well, but they have to have training. They have to have support. They have to have sponsorship. They have to have mentorship. We have to be able to provide that and we have to be able to show the way that says we're going to give those opportunities. So I think it's really about, like you said, we got to have opportunity for everyone because the industry um, is, is, is lacking, especially when it comes to the engineering or the technical sides, it's lacking. So we want that opportunity for everyone. But young women need to know that these are the types of things they can do. I think you're doing an awesome job of being that example. I want to be an example. I love that. You may be the first, but make sure you're not the last. And that's our show for today. The Air Up There is a podcast from the Federal Aviation Administration. If you liked today's episode, remember to subscribe and share it with someone else. You can find the FAA on social media. We're at FAA on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn and at FAA News on Twitter and YouTube. And on behalf of the entire team of women that produced this episode, we wish you a very happy Women's History Month. Thanks for listening.